Hi, hello, and welcome, everybody, to our very first SBC web show. My name is Bo Estes. You see our guests right there. But before we get to them, we all want to send a shout out to really thank our first responders because their hard work, their bravery allows us to do what we're doing here. And it's going to be our best pathway back to some sort of normalcy, which is what we're all hoping for. But with that in mind, we're here to do an SBC web show. And what's the idea behind that? Well, we wanted to get some industry leaders together to sort of talk a little sports, a little business, and a little hoops. And the common thread with all of our guests here is that they have some connection to SBC, the immersive broadcast salary cap analytics scouting program that wraps around the Las Vegas Summer League. Uh, and with that in mind, my name's Bo Estes. I've mentioned that. I work with NBA TV. I work with NBA.com. And the first guy I want to mention, Wes Wilcox. Wes, you were instrumental in that salary cap and we're well, really scouting an analytics program with Dave DeFord last year. If you could uh, tell us, you, you know, you're a former general manager of the Atlanta Hawks and then you go through this experience. What was that like for you? Oh, well, Bo, first of all, it's great to be with you and everybody else, Albert and Jeff. Um, this is a great thing that, you know, Albert has really started to, you know, create content to share in this time. So, you know, thank you for having me. Uh, but SBC, is it, it, it's really a, a great event because, number one, it gives you a chance to give back and to kind of share your experiences with the next generation that, you know, someday wants to be where, you know, where guys like us have been and where we will be in the future. So it's a great opportunity to share and learn, but it's also a great opportunity to get to know um, some of the up and coming young talent in the world of sports. And, you know, everybody's going to get to hear from Jeff Siegel, who's with us today, but he's a great example of that. Someone that I've built a relationship with, I've learned from, and he's done just a fantastic job in building this website that many across the industry now use as a tool to help them understand what's going on you know, in the NBA from a financial and salary cap perspective. So it's, it's a great event uh, to be a part of, to give back, to learn from, uh, run by just terrific people. Well, Wes, you stole my segue there. Uh, Jeff, you are one of the emerging guys in this business. Uh, I, I know that you run the Early Bird Rights uh, website. Tell us a little bit. You're the only person that's gone through this program as a student. Tell us what that experience was like and what future stu students could expect. Yeah, I went through the program in 2017. It was just a fantastic way for me to you know, learn the, the ins and outs of the salary cap. Uh, you know, I was part of the, the salary cap program when I was there. And I, you know, I was able to you know, pick up so many little things that, that helped me build my website into you know, sort of what it is today, where you, know, you can find you know, the most up-to-date and accurate salary cap information. If I don't know the, every in and you know every in and out of the salary cap, then that's you know that whole website isn't even possible. You know, so that was the bit the one of the biggest things that I took away from SBC. You know, and then secondarily is just you know you get to network with all sorts of of you know high end NBA executives, former NBA executives, people who you know have been in our shoes and are willing to you know help you get to where you want to go. And so I think you know between to those two things. That's you know really what you can expect at SBC. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to meet people who are you know high up in the in the basketball world, and you're going to be able to sort of show what you can do and learn so that you can do that even better the next year. And I think Jeff hit on something important there. I, I feel like all of our role here is to help young people get to where they want to go in this business. And with that, Albert, we bring in you. You're the president of Hall Pass Media. You're the guy who brought us all together. Uh, I know the business of basketball has changed tremendously in the last couple of months, but that doesn't mean your squad at Hall Pass has slowed down. If anything, you've picked up the pace. What are you guys working on right now? Hey, Bo. Uh, thanks for having us all here today. And uh, it's been an interesting time. Obviously, let me take a step back before I jump into that question. But just to touch on SBC a little bit. I mean, SBC, as we started this, my partner Warren Legary and I, you know, we did Summer League 16 years ago and, and founded that, and that's developed in all different areas. Uh, but one of the things that, and the common theme was 
not only are we developing talent for the league on the floor, we wanted to develop the talent off the floor. And I think Wes touched on it a little bit. Understanding all these young, up and coming, bright minds, unbelievable energy, um, people that just needed an opportunity. And Summer League provides an unbelievable platform for that. So SBC has morphed into this program that really uh, developed an unbelievable network throughout the league, throughout the industry. And each year we try to develop, uh, reconfigure the curriculum, whatever it may be. Larry Kuhn, who's our general manager of SBC, does a great job. Uh, but each year we, we try to extract some things out of there. And I think now what you're seeing with the change in sports business, the change in what we're doing here today on the web show. I mean, this is just one example of how SBC can pivot off of the normal you know, technology or the normal curriculum into something new. And uh, with my team at Hall Pass and VSL uh, properties, which we're always looking at, hey, how do we stay relevant? And I mean, that's been the biggest challenge for us. We're not a big parent company. We don't have a parent company. We're a small shop. Um, we, we, we grow and, and, and change and navigate the, the, uh, the landscape of the business of basketball in a variety of ways. So we've been doing everything we can to stay relevant. The web shows, uh, producing a number of content uh, options, um, staying connected with our network, engaging our, our business contacts, engaging our talent contacts of the young people that are in our program. And I think this is just another example of it today. I tell you what, from my perspective, SBC is the program that I wished was there when I came out of college 25 years ago. Because when I came out, I walked into a job with a four-year degree, sure, but not the experience and not the understanding necessary to swim right in and go full speed. And I think from my perspective, SBC, more than I ever even imagined the first time I joined the program, really gives the students that understanding and that background to get going right away. And, and to me, that was the best part of it. Um, I want to jump into another topic now, the economic uh, impact of this NBA hiatus. And Albert, let, let's go right back to you. You're a business owner. You know, your ship is tied to hoops in a large way. You've got lots of competing in interests. You want to stay engaged. Uh, you, you've got you know, concerns about everything. How did you navigate that? And how does it change from day one when this thing sort of breaks out to now how things are going? It's been tough. There's no doubt. I mean, just like anyone else uh, in a business, they're an industry that's completely stopped. I mean, we, we've had to really take a look at, at all areas of our business, you know, cover the costs that we have. I mean, revenues have really kind of just come to a, a pause, really. I, I'm not going to say a halt, but a pause because um, there's just so much uncertainty. I mean, these are new times for all of us. Um, obviously, we're waiting on different calendars and, and the calendars meaning when are broadcasts going to happen, when are events going to happen, um, all of those things. And we've, we've really tried to navigate those waters and be ahead of it. Um, the web show, as I said, is one. I mean, we, we've come up with a variety of situations and circumstances uh, on how to run a new live event. So live events is a big part of our business. So working with our medical professionals, our, our infectious control team, our, our event and venue operators, not only from an NBA standpoint, but we also are highly involved in the TBT now, which is the, the basketball tournament, which, which was due to, to start up right after NBA Summer League. Um, we have a number of things that we operate with NBA Coaches Association. So everybody is in a holding pattern, but really the, the challenge is you, you try to control what you can. And unfortunately right now, that's not a lot for all of us. <laughs> Um, but you, you also look at, look, if there is a new opportunity that arises or a new industry or a new um, niche in this business, you got to be ready to strike. I, I, I joked around the other day with our guys. I said, look, if, we're, if we need to build boats, we're going to build both, right? We just need to be able to, to do that and pivot. Pivot is a key word for all of us, you know, and we do that pretty well at Hall Pass uh, with a nimble team. But it's been a challenge. There's no doubt not knowing what it is and, and part of doing these shows themselves is the mental capacity. I mean, that's going to be a big, uh, a big challenge for all of us throughout this time is how do we stay mentally sharp? How do we, how do we maintain our obligations at home and our families and all of that without losing that, that edge in, in business and in basketball, as you said, it's hyper competitive. Um, there's only, you know, there's only a handful of people that do what we do with the NBA and these relationships and with SBC. So you know, for us, it's staying sharp and, and figuring out what's next. But in the meantime, motivating, keeping everybody fresh and, and ready to go when, when we're called. 
Wes, I, I, you know, I think about something Albert said about staying sharp and everything like that. You've been involved. You, you've been a general manager of a team. How would you be communicating with people during during this circumstance? And tell me about the timeline also for the NBA. Why that calendar is so important for them as they try to get back and play out this season. Yeah, well, talking talking to people around the NBA and friends across the league right now, um, you know. Front offices, coaches, medical teams are staying, you know, in day-to-day contact with their players. A, a lot of them are doing, you know, Zoom workouts, like like conditioning workouts. Uh, many are are just the normal course of communication, texting, phone calls. Everybody in this time is going to stay connected to to their players and their staff because you know staffs are a part too. And the front offices are working on the NBA draft and they're holding Zoom calls or, you know, Microsoft team calls or, you know, opportunities like this where they're working like they would be in the office, but just doing it through technology. Because one of the challenges in this current time is the NBA draft is still on, you know, still on the calendar and at the end of June and and teams have to assume that that's going to happen until they know otherwise. I think everyone is kind of believes that that will be pushed back, but we don't know that because that's going to come after a decision on you know how they're going to handle the season, so so everybody is doing their best using technology to stay connected at this time. And then your second question about starting the season and restarting the season, you know it, that's going to be driven one by of course the medical community. Two, we're going to need public sentiment, you know, to move in favor of something like this, uh, and. Third, though, is is there's going to be a significant focus on player health, and this period of time, th- this this delay, this pause, as Albert said, you know, every player has a different physical, you know, training setup. Some some many players are living in apartments, and those apartment complexes, I've understood, in some cases, have their fitness centers shut down. So teams have sent you know training equipment to their players houses or apartments to try to help give them something that they can do um, to stay in condition. And so I would imagine that we're going to have a really nice run up before we actually start playing games again, assume, you know, assuming we do, we all hope we do, but you're going to have a good 20, 25, 30 day window. I would think at minimum to know that you're going to, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to recondition to before we restart the season. Hey, what do you, what do you think that's, that's talk about that too for a second, Bo? Like everything that Wes mentioned from a from a, a player health, uh, all of those, you know, everything that goes into restarting. Take it another step now from a, a live event operator. All of the venues, all of the arenas, um, you know, everything that goes into that. I mean, these businesses are designed to run at you know a hundred percent capacity. Yeah. Our Vegas hotels, for example. I mean. You know, and shutting that down and, and slowly coming back, whether it be 25, 40 percent, whatever it may be, it's really a strained challenge now to come up with a business model where you can actually make money and make a living. Right. I mean, because yeah. they're not designed to do that. I mean, these guys generally their margins are once you're 80 percent capacity is where your margins at right above that. Mm-hmm. So now we're talking about, look, you have to design an entire plan, not only for live games and to keep everyone healthy, but testing. Right the basketball operations side of it, the venue management, security, sterilization, all of these different things. These are these are scenarios that we've been running in our head over and over and over again, trying to come up with a solution. And it's challenging. But as Wes touched on, that calendar, once that's put in place, then that will help us kind of develop a game plan off of that. And, and it's, it's funny because this ecosystem of basketball, we all know, Without one kind of, you know, with one, one touch point touching the other, it's there's a disconnect. So we kind of really we need to connect that not only just from basketball, but just the global sports business. Well, what I'm curious about is is so a timeline, we get word that okay, we're good to go whenever. A team's gonna need what, Wes, a month to get training and to be ready to play a game. And does that correspond with Albert, your timeline? For a live event, is that right, West? Roughly a month to get going, or you think it's more or less than that? Um, my my gut is we'll get some sort of heads up that we'll start in you know a training camp in two weeks or so or something, and then then there'll be a twenty five day or twenty day or twenty three day. You know, so in total, my guess is you're going to have 
you know, players in the facilities for a couple of weeks to get conditioned. And then you're going to have some sort of training camp and, you know, some, some total of, of 30 to 40 days. I will say though, there's one big difference that is really challenging in this environment is let's assume we're going to have a very compressed regular season window, a couple games, right? Right now, the, the eighth seed in, and the ninth seed in both conferences, I mean, the closest I think is like three and a half games or three games. Sure. And so you have 14 teams out there essentially that kind of know they're not in the playoffs, right? And, and, and that's, their motivation. that's the greatest challenge. There's 16 teams that believe that they're in. And so every one of those players – and that those staffs, they know that they're dialed in. The, and so I think it's easier to condition and train and prepare in that setting, whereas the biggest concern is the 14 teams because that mental sharpness, when you know you're – and you saw Steve Kerr said this just the other day, that they, yeah. they're kind of acting like they're, they kind of know their season's over. That's where the risk is, I think, from a ramping up perspective because those, those, those 14 teams, those players kind of know – you know, that they're not really going to advance. And so that goes back to what Albert talks about. If you, you can't just assume that we'll blow those games off because what is it? 21% of the season. That's a lot of revenue. That's, that's dangling out there. I suppose a Albert, the timeline that Wes talked about you as a live event operator, can you, can you work in like the 45 day window to get things up and running on that side as well? Does that correspond? Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, obviously, there's some flexibility with our partners, um, whether it be hotels, logistics, arenas, all of those good things. Um, but yeah, I mean, when they say we got to jump, we're going to say how high and, you know, we'll, we'll be there. And again, I, I, I use those words pivot and nimble. Um, very key words with our business right now and everything that we do. But look, I, I think May 1st, and I knew we'd get into this conversation a little bit. It's almost inevitable to kind of, you know, foreshadow and project here. But I think uh, May 1st, we'll know a little bit more from a from a timeline perspective out of the league office. But uh, look, the idea is no one, everybody's uh, in uncharted territory, both, you know, and we'll get into the free agency, the draft, because as, as, as a guy, I'm not with a team. Our business is the second season, right? There's two seasons. There's the team, the regular season and the playoffs when you're with the team and the league. Then there's the second season, which that's how Wes and I've become such good friends over the years as we see each other all over the world and different events. And we're in the gym 10 hours a day, watching prospects, putting on events at camps, you name it. That's a real important part of the league, right? So you now have to adjust. And those aren't, those aren't like set calendars. Those are generally remote locations that need to be adjusted. So, I mean, again, there's so many different, uh, you know, dominoes that need to fall into place. And once we have that kind of general framework of, you know, the plan, then everybody will start to, you know, cover their respective areas and develop a game plan for those. And Jeff, all of this leads up to, uh, there, there's a lot of lost revenue that's, that's going to sit out there. That's going to affect the salary cap. That's going to affect free agency. You tell us how, because there, there's, there's a lot of complications from this revenue situation. Yeah, I mean, at this point, we don't even really know how this is going to affect the the 2020-2021 salary cap and how that's going to affect their, you know, their revenue projections. You know, as Albert was hitting on, you know, if, if everybody sort of oper needs to operate at, you know, 80% capacity, well, what if it's 0% capacity? Like, what if we have no fans until January 2021? And you know the, the the league has to sort of make their revenue adjustments, and the, the those revenue adjustments can hit the salary cap. They don't necessarily have to. You know, it's all sort of up in the air between the NBA and the the players' association. They're going to have to come together and you know basically agree on a projection for revenue for next year, and then agree on a salary cap. That you know those two things don't necessarily have to be tied together. Usually they are because you know under usual circumstances revenue goes up, salary cap goes up, everybody's happy. In this situation, you know they can they can decide to you know have the salary cap drop, which would have you know massive impacts on team building, on on 
you know, team cap space this summer on teams, you know, trying to stay, you know, borderline on the on the tax line. That's another big concern for for a lot of teams. You know, I heard from an executive yesterday on a team that has, you know, that is right on the the luxury tax line, and he's really concerned about, you know, how their how their team is going to to be able to handle this if the if the luxury tax line drops from you know a projected 139 million down to say 133, 130 million. That's going to be a massive financial impact on a team. That is already, you know, impacted in a big way by this, and so, you know, you you see how teams can, you know, be impacted by this, you know, massive, you know, economic crisis, you know, just in terms of how they build their rosters and and what, you know, which free agents are going, they're going to be willing to to pay to bring back when it's going to cost them a lot more than they had planned, you know, going into this this past season, going into the season before that. So, you know, at this point. So much is up in the air. You would think that both sides, the players and the owners, would like to, you know, sh- you know, both show a, a semblance of strength with, you know, showing a $115 million salary cap. You know, I think that would be beneficial to both sides. And then they can figure out the finances a little bit similar to how they're doing it now, where they just take more, uh, you know, take more cash out of each paycheck. You know, they're doing that now rather than 10% going to escrow. They're now doing 12.5% for the rest of this season. So I think that is another, you know, path in, ter- in terms of, you know, making it, making the revenue even on both sides, but not necessarily, you know, completely changing the team building process. Is is there an avenue for sort of an exception uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, or even could they make a one-time exception that, that sort of delivers teams from that luxury tax or is the, is the, the agreement, the agreement? The agreement is not, it, nothing is set in stone. They can do literally whatever they want. They can totally rip up the CBA and write a completely new one. They can write rules that just apply to this coming year. They can do rules that apply to the next three years if they want to sort of smooth that decline in. Obviously, smoothing is a little bit of a you know touchy subject after 2016, but sure. you know it, it, this is sort of the opposite of that. Maybe the the players and the owners would be more interested in sort of a, a downward smoothing instead of an upward smoothing. So I think you know. There's nothing that's set in stone. Everything is negotiable. Everything is on the table. That's the most important thing I think for people to realize is that nothing, we don't know anything about what could happen or what might happen. Everything is negotiable. They they can put all of this stuff on the table. They can lower the salary cap and keep the luxury tax threshold where it was supposed to be. That's that's totally fine too. It's just up to the agreement between the the, the league and the players. Wes, from a team perspective, say you got a guy like Jeff on staff, what are you wanting to know from him? Is it is it several different projections of what things could look like? And what are your concerns if you're running a team? Yeah, well, I mean, Jeff hit it on the head. Uh, first, from a global perspective, the, the only thing I would add to that is just as a point of clarity, that would need to be negotiated between the owners and amongst themselves first. The governors would have to agree for the you know internal league mechanics regarding salary cap and luxury tax um, levels internally, and then the league would have to negotiate that with the players' association as well. Um, so so it gets a little bit complicated. Um, one of the but 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 it can all be done absolutely. Jeff is a hundred percent right. Nothing is set in stone. One of the more interesting things here though is let's just say that the salary cap. Um, and the luxury tax were to come down, which it may not, but if revenues come down because we lose gains, in theory, you, you know, everyone kind of assumes that, you know, there will be some kind of downward adjustment. That's why the league office is withholding more money from the players' paychecks to make sure that they're able to level set appropriately and that the players get what they are, you know, what they are, you know, contracted to receive just above 50% of all basketball related income. But it, 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 it's a double, it's a double hit though. Cause not only if we brought, you know, the luxury tax down for next year, everyone is using this number, you know, in the future to build their teams. Right. And so everyone has this number of 139 or roughly $140 million that look, we're going to stay under that number. We're going to go, over, we're going to go over by this amount. But if that gets adjusted downward, it's really, it, it, it hits you twice because one, there's the general revenue impact that every team is facing. And then you're going to have a more punitive potential tax impact if they don't advise the tax downward. So it's really for those teams that would move from near the tax line into the tax line, they're really getting hit twice. And so this is one of the more interesting things to follow 
to see how the league kind of a, a, approaches this because the spirit of, of the rule is what often governs the governs the league office. And the spirit of the salary tax of the, the luxury tax is to say, listen, everyone has a barometer that if you pay to this number and you go above, you, you do so knowingly that you know you're gonna pay a penalty to do that because you have a competitive, you believe that's a competitive advantage for your organization. And so if I had to bet the league would make some sort of adjustment because of the spirit of the rule and with the you know un unusual circumstances they're not going to want to hit the teams twice but on the other hand there may be some governors and some teams that want this to be you know more punitive because it makes it more difficult in a competitive landscape so that's why this one is going to be really interesting to see amongst a lot of things this is going to be one very interesting element to see play out. Well, Wes talked about the spirit. Uh, Jeff, in your conversations, is there a spirit of cooperation? Do people want to sort of uh, make this work going forward? Yeah, that's what I've heard from, from executives and from players and from player agents as well. Everybody's sort of trying to pull together. You can see that with the, the NBA and the NBPA coming together to, to agree on this 12.5% or 25% for the rest of the season, but 12.5% overall uh, sort of revenue give back or, or salary give back from, from the player side. I think a lot of people on both sides really want this thing to work. They want to, to come to uh, an amicable agreement for all parties. Everybody knows that this is not what anybody planned for. You know, everybody understands that, you know, perhaps the competitiveness of, you know, the, the, the competition between teams perhaps comes to a, a you know, lo goes lower on the, the sort of priority list than just sort of the overall health of the league. That's that's the sense that I've been getting when it comes down to actually making these decisions. You know, perhaps we, we you know, the, the smaller market owners who aren't anywhere near the tax are going to be like, hey, you know, you're out of luck. That's your problem, not ours. So, you know, we'll see where that comes from. But at, at this point, everybody has been, uh, you know, particularly amicable in terms of, you know, their talks with each other. An adjustment. I would say this too, Bo, just from an adjustment standpoint, I mean, every contract right now that we have or that we're a part of, I mean, everyone has been willing to adjust, right? That's been the mindset of basically the, the economy globally. Um, you know, I know I've read and, and know a few things and had a couple of conversations that the 70 game minimum was a kind of a sticking point for television broadcast rights, right? They wanted to fulfill that. I think that may be something they're looking at right now. Like, look, there's no way to do that and pull off a playoff and, you know, throughout this timeline and window. So that could be an adjustment there. I mean, ESPN and some of the rights holders like Warner or ESPN, I mean, their, their fear would likely be that all of these rights holders or rights leagues that they have rights to, they all fall and become live at the same time, right? So they're all stacked on top of each other. That's a, not a great scenario in order to to make money, right, and generate revenue. They want these things spread out over time. You have different campaigns against each league, against each playoff, whatever it may be. So that's a challenge and something that they're adjusting right now as well because there's only so many broadcast windows. They want to air, whether it be the Masters, MLB, you know, MLS, NBA, NFL, all these things. And, um, you know, I've had this conversation with both you, all three of you guys, I think, off air, but – uh, to me, the big indicator is going to be for live events is college football. You know, if you look at that, I mean, across the landscape of sports, you're talking, you know, 150 to 200 venues filled on a Saturday. Right. And all of the revenue and then the non-conference games for some of these schools, that's their entire athletic budget is based on that. So I think that will be a really big indicator along with the NBA. Obviously, the NBA is everybody's waiting to see what happens. But you start putting all of these things in place. There's no doubt that it's going to be a challenge. But I think there needs to be flexibility. And that is the common theme across the, the sports business right now is every contract, everything. We've never been in this situation. We all need to be flexible and then make the best of 2020 and then project and strategically design 2021. Well, the last topic I, I wanted to touch on is, you know, it's sports business classroom teaches students. We're here for the students. So any advice for students trying to best position themselves for a job when things get going back closer to normal? Jeff, I wanted to start with you uh, since you're closer to the start of your career in basketball than uh, us graybeards, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> tell us uh, what's been your approach. What, what have you done to take advantage of this time? I mean, if you have the bandwidth to, to, you know, to 
work on other projects that are outside of your sort of normal day-to-day -day, you know, job, then this is the time to really hone your skills in a, in a new area or really sort of you know, hone in on the, the skills that you need to succeed at the next level, whatever that next level is, whether you want to work for ESPN and be, you know, a broadcaster, whether you want to work for a team and be, you know, a, a front office executive, whether you want to be a coach, a scout, an advanced scout, whatever you want to do, this is the time to, you know, push yourself to learn a new skill, to, you know, hone in on the skills that you had, you know, previously skills that, you know, perhaps had, had waned in the past because you've got, you know, your day job and you're working with your family and all this stuff. Now, if you have the bandwidth to do it, if you're, you know, if you have a job that, you know, perhaps you're not going to every day, you've got all of this extra commute time that you no longer, you know, have to spend in your car going from place to place. This is the time to sort of use that extra time and, and really push yourself to, you know, to add a new skill or to, you know, really hone the skills that you already have. Wes, piggybacking on what, what Jeff said, I, I just keep thinking about people who are coming out of college, they've done everything right and they've really prepared themselves and boom, this hits and they feel, man, my career's delayed a bit. I may have college loans I got to pay for. What in your mind should they be doing right now to best prepare themselves for a career? Well, we get this question all the time and it's one of the most common questions at SBC is how do you, you know, transition from college into this career in the NBA? And we are in a unique time right now because of COVID-19 and this pause. And Jeff did a really good job of explaining how you can differentiate and use this time to your advantage. But we're also in a different era with social media, one where Bo, you, you know, yourself, Albert, myself, we didn't have, we didn't grow up with this era. And so we, talk, we, we think about it from a player's perspective all the time. They can control their brand. They can communicate their voice across um, you know, the industry. And, and, and now it's actually changed the way teams have to deal with PR and how change teams, teams, how changes teams deal with medical. But it's also a great opportunity for every young person out there. If they're able to navigate the social media landscape well enough, they can communicate to the entire NBA basketball community, the entire front office community. And you know, the best example of this is Jeff Siegel sitting with us now. This is how I met Jeff Siegel by following Twitter. And so literally on Twitter, I, 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 you know, it's retweets or connection. I don't even know how it all works, but I do know I just kept seeing this guy's name. And so I click on his website, I go to his website, I study his website and I'm like, he's got an email address. And so I email him at, you know, on his email address. And so I'm like, can I talk to you? You might want to talk to me. I had a cool job one time. And he's like, yeah, sure. I know exactly who you are. And so pretty soon we're on the phone and then I build Jeff and I spend time because he's communicating, he's building content, sharing it through social media cha channels, which then attracts people in the industry back to his work. And then you get to know Jeff and you realize his stuff is as good as what most teams are producing and using internally. And so then I call Albert and I'm like, Albert, do you remember this guy who did SBC? He's like killing it. And all of a sudden we're here today. And look, I'm not blowing smoke. This is exactly how it happened. And so if we wanna know how to take advantage of this current time, it's really this global time. Use social media to your advantage, spend the time, you know, educate yourself and then communicate to the basketball community through social how you can help. Because at the end of the day, Albert knows this, Bo knows this, Jeff is doing this. The way you get a job is you show people the value that you have to the people you're working for, because all of us are looking for help. All of us are looking for people to help us. And that's exactly what Jeff Siegel has done. And that's why he's going to work in a front office, because he has shown and proven that he has value to somebody sitting in that chair. That's Congratulations, it. Jeff. Yeah. Well, I, 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 that. Right now, so. yeah. oh, he, he I think he just got hired, Jeff. Yeah, speak it into existence. I'm very happy to just, <laughs> just keep talking and hopefully it'll happen. But, but here's the thing that is, a, Wes nailed it perfectly, but that's what makes us so proud of SBC and this program. When we say fully immersive, you always hear you get out of it what you put into it. Okay, guess what? This is the real deal, right? And, and, creating and finding value, finding a niche, that's it. I used to say, hey, I'm a Swiss army knife, whatever. Okay, 
that's my skill set. And I've, you know, morphed into specialties in certain areas. But a guy like Jeff said, hey, I'm going two feet in, right? And we always say that every time at SBC when I'm talking to him, it's like, look, it's, it's easy to straddle the fence, but go two feet in, right? And once you do that and don't look back, chances are if you're good at what you're going to do and, you know, you build the relationships, the connections, you'll find an opportunity to kick the door down. Um, we've done that, you know, and, and going back SBC, I have to give shout outs to, to Sergio Millis and, and Max Miller, our producer today. I mean, Serge is ahead of all of our digital content. And, you know, he, he created this whole platform for SBC to be more engaged, more involved. We're now doing the SBC uh, audio experience podcast. Max Miller has created the Shooting to Score podcast. So like we're, we're engaging these people and these, you know, the young up and comers that come through the program and trying to do whatever we can to assist them in their career. It's tough now, especially we you know, we've kind of gone through three phases. You take care of, make sure you're safe and sound through this. Then you, you kind of look at, okay, I need to kind of look at what net what's next. And now we need to prepare, right? I mean, I've been using this whole hashtag this week of, of compete, right? It's like right now we all are competitors. There's no doubt. We love competing. And this is the perfect time to kind of, I don't say reinvent, but re reformulate, retool yourself a little bit going, okay, when the, when the, the green light hits, we need to go. And that's why SBC, I mean, we have over between SBC and our VSL talent um, uh, database of, of interns who have served with us. I mean, we have over 160 people working in this business now who've come through our programs. That is the lifeline for all of us. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, we're learning from them, as Wes said. He's, I'm learning from Jeff. I'm learning from other people in our programs. Uh, just this year, I mean, I, I can think of, you know, whether it be Shea Dawson at overtime or Nikki Gross going to, to um, uh, Vanderbilt University. I mean, there's all these different stories that we have. And go back to the Nick Urenz who started with us as an intern who's now in the front office with Golden State. I mean, those are the people that we bounce ideas off of. Um, and that's how you develop this network. And as SBC, you know, morphs and goes in, there's going to be new um, avenues and new opportunities in this business, whether it be in basketball or just sports in general. We will then educate ourselves. We'll huddle up with the people that we know who can teach it or who can, you know, exercise a great curriculum like Larry, like Bo, yourself. I mean, what you're doing with the jobs in sports and broadcasting and all of your, uh, you know, plethora of opportunities that you have. Um, with not only the NBA, but NBL, like those minds and those creative people, we open up and the goal is with SBC is to create more opportunities. I mean, I had, I had a, a person last night call me and say, hey, who do you have as female coaches in your system? Uh, I may have a couple opportunities when this thing kicks, right? So, I mean, we're getting those kinds of calls all the time. Um, you know, Wes and I have, were mutual friends on, on the agency side, right? And they're looking at, hey, what talent do you have? It's no different than recruiting. We have some great young talent at SBC. So to Jeff's point, like, look, using this time to fine tune your skills, you know, come up with some new ideas and all that, be ready to roll. And because when we when we uh, have these opportunities, someone gives us a call, you know, VSL and SBC are going to provide a platform for you to get your foot in the door. I think be ready to roll is important. I mean, I know that I was on the air on the afternoon that the league shut down at NBA TV. That morning, I got a format from a producer who said, let's talk about which teams are going to make the playoffs and which teams aren't. And by the end of the day, we're shutting down the league. So it was it was a fascinating, obviously different than any experience I've had in television in 25 years. But then you got to be ready to roll. I was doing NBL work later that week, and now I've jumped up and thrown on my real estate hat. And as soon as soon as soon as we close this show, I'm headed out to work on that. So whatever you can work on, you got to be working, you got to be hustling, and you got to be working smart. Uh, Albert, I'll give the last word to you. Uh, you know, when when the economy comes back and everything's really solid, what do you want to see from people that will get them hired in your eyes? What sets a person apart? What can they be doing right now? Um, I use the word iteration, right? I mean, again, keeping your stuff sharp adapting to what the new circumstances are, whether it be the cap, be informed how that's going to affect you. You know, Wes is a perfect example, like running in front office, pivots off of that, becomes an NBA insider. He's learned the media side of it. He's going to be ready and he's in an excellent position to you know jump back and lead a team. From our standpoint, it, you know, everybody has tried to automate and become very digital. That's great. There's nothing like personal communication. 
There is nothing. We're missing that. All of us are missing. I, I want to give everybody here like just a bro hug. Hey, what's going on? But at the same time, you're missing that. I mean, my uh, quick story. My wife's a teacher. They did a little survey last night on um, distance learning. They, they just surveyed the 38 kids that were in there. 37 of them want to go back to school, right? Only one wants to just continue distance learning, right? Because at the end of the day, we all need that interpersonal communication. So what I, I mean, again, sharpen your, your network. Make sure you reach out to people. People have time right now. As Jeff said, that you will get a response back more than likely, right? Um, so be ready there. I, I would say, look, follow up, continue to, there's a lot of people out there in the unemployment line. There's, and I feel for those folks. There's also people who are, you know, hanging on, do whatever you can to create that value, right? And if, if you have to pivot off what you're good at and learn something else, be amenable to it, right? Be able to jump in and say, hey, I want to learn that. I want to know how to do it. But but keep your network sharp. Keep your personal skills sharp. Don't just sit back and, you know, wait for the phone to ring, like engage with people. That's what you have to do, because no matter what, it, there's a there's an effect on our bodies, on our minds, on our spirit. Everything is when you're around people and you feed off that energy. That's a good thing. Uh, hopefully we can see this economy start to you know, slowly get back to it. I know out here in California, we're, we're, we're optimistic. Um, I think we, we definitely dodged a bullet when all of this was going on. We had rain for like three weeks straight. So it kept everybody inside. And that may have been a good thing uh, going forward. But, you know, you're seeing people do that, get that energy, bring that spirit, you know, don't stay down in the dumps. I mean, healthy too. This is another thing too. Like everybody, you're seeing this. If nothing comes out of COVID, it's, it's to show you, Look, take better care of yourself. Eat healthy, right? Get some exercise. Keep that mind sharp um, because obviously you're reducing the chance of, of catching it and you're seeing that, you know, 90 plus percent are recovering on certain, you know, without uh, being an elderly or having a pre pre-existing medical condition. But that's the one thing my family's been doing. My dog is getting more walks than she ever has before in her life. So um, again, keep your, keep your family, your friends, your colleagues, keep everybody close and you know, expand that, expand that network during this time. And then when it pops, be ready to go. And if someone says, Hey, you know, you're generally, I've had you going left the whole time. Now you need to go right. You do it just like a player, you know, working on their game in the off season, they try to develop a, a different skill every off season, you know, going back to Olajuwon or Kobe or whomever it is. Now you've got these guys, Hey, I've got Harden's got the step back, whatever it is. You know, you got to refine your, your, your skill set. And I would say it's the same thing in business. Um, you know, it's a, it's a new landscape out there and it's going to be very treacherous in certain areas. The normalcy that we're used to is out the window. So, you know, be ready to roll it and, and have your, uh, your best shoes on because you're going to need some dancing feet. All right, Jeff, Wes, Albert, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll just add on one piece of advice. Uh, and it's the first thing I'm going to do when we get back out there. Get a haircut when you get out of here, people. We all need haircuts right now. It's a desperate good, situation. Though. Oh, Bo, you look good. You look, you know, hey, you're young, young and ready to roll. Basically, I'm applying for a job in California, somewhere in the surf community, if I can get it. That's what I'm looking for, guys. Again, thanks so much, fellas. It's good to see your faces. As a reminder, if I could, too, just to, again, to shout out for SBC. Uh, you know, we're, we don't know when this thing will pop, but we are still taking registrations. Uh, yeah. You know, that continues all the time. Um, we will continue to update curriculums, engage people. Uh, for our SBC alumni, if you haven't engaged in VSL talent, we have our own LinkedIn platform that we use and utilize. And like I said, we send a link to people. Um, keep an eye out. I will, I, you know, I can't, I can't release too much, but right before this hit, we had a real proud moment that Wes was a part of that we've worked on a project with Warner Media and um, uh, SAP on for S uh, some uh, SBC alumni. So this this network is ever expanding. I just re remind everybody, stay engaged, do what you can. And if you haven't experienced it yet, don't be afraid to register. We'll get this thing cranking up again when uh, when we're all back to work. That's right. And, and the hub for all of this, go to sportsbusinessclassroom.com. That's where you can keep up with all of this information. And also this show, this is the maiden voyage right here. The first show, our rookie experience, guys every Thursday. So you're going to want to check back in every Thursday for the SBC web show. My name's Bo Estes for Albert, Wes, and Jeff. Thanks so much, guys. And thanks so much, everybody, for watching. Take care.